Yeah, thanks for the intro. Uh, again, my name is Keith Adams. I'm an engineer uh, here at Facebook AI Research. Um, here's my clicker, I suppose. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the work that, uh, that engineers like me do in the infrastructure team uh, in Facebook AI Research, trying to make uh, deep models go faster. Um, before diving in here, I want to kind of uh, confess something. Right? This is, I'm here to beg for help, not to tell you what to do. This talk is more about questions than answers. Um, so, you know, I'm not a member, I, I'm not a member in amazingly great standing of this community. Most of my bona fides are in systems and PL, um, but this is an adjacent area with a bunch of open problems that I suspect uh, you guys have insights that can help me. So, um, moving right along, what we're going to do here is uh, we're going to try to do the world's uh, most economical introduction to deep learning, because we don't have a ton of time to do it. Uh, but you need to know a little bit about it to understand what's hard about it, so I'll try and do that. Uh, we'll, we'll go into um, what it is that systems people like me are doing in machine learning, why, why it is that performance matters and how it matters and uh, why it's hard. Uh, what we have done and continue to do in single system image parallelization and getting more, uh, more performance out of a single machine. Um, the beginnings of, of how distributed deep learning works, and this is sort of really where I consider it uh, you know, a wide open area, and then we'll wrap up. So um, without further ado, um, you know, even if, you're not a even if you're not exposed to machine learning practitioners on a daily basis, you're aware that this area exists. There's lots of different lenses to view machine learning in. I like to think of it as a way to write programs we otherwise don't know how to write. Um, now, you know, you're, you're so used to sort of seeing this example because it's, uh, you know, they're visually compelling and so on. A lot, of time, a lot of deep learning demos are very focused on images. I promise it won't only be about vision in this. Uh, but it's kind of hard to get your head around unless you play with this every day, the degree, you know, how amazing it is that we can do things like image categorization, given that the inputs to these things really are triples of RGB values, right? Um, you know, if I asked you, if I drop you down in your programming editor and say, okay, bool, is this thing a cat or not, open parentheses, you know, vector of vector of doubles, um, you know, your cursor's gonna blink there for a while with the left curly brace before you figure out where to start writing code, right? It's really not obvious. Um, Translation, we're increasingly used to the idea that machines can actually do this for us. Uh, you know, I don't speak Czech, but I'm told that sort of is a vaguely plausible Czech translation of the English input here. Um, one of the reasons I'm pointing this out is just, you know, that these problems sort of are real posed, right? There's actually lots of outputs that are pretty decent Czech translations of that chunk of English. Um, one you don't see very often, it used to be fashionable in sort of old school AI that I think is getting a little more attention these days is program inference. Um, so this is the problem, you know, given this set of input-output pairs, write me the program that produces this set of input-output pairs. And we ask human programmers to do this all the time, and they generally agree whether they've done it or not. But if you think about this for a second, it's completely ill-posed, right? You know, I could just as easily write, you know, if it's 3 and 2, then return 11. If it's 2 and 1, return 7. If it's negative 3 and 4, return 13, as I could, you know, this sort of nice little expression. But we have these strong priors that if you're asking me to do this, it makes sense to do it somehow, and so I should write a program that's you know, general and concise and so on, and all these other little heuristics. And it's hard to say what we mean by general and concise and so on. So here's where, I, uh, where things are gonna get controversial. Uh, you know, I do work for Jan LeCun, I have an opinion here, I think deep learning's cool. Um, but you know, in, in, a, you know, in, in extreme sort of caricature here, um, the way that typical machine learning pipelines tend to work these days are that you, the first thing you do is that you radically transform your inputs. And you may or may not store this radical transformation, but you do something really, really different, right? So if you're trying to detect cats, you don't want to deal with RGB triples, right? You're going to, you know, sort of stare off in the middle distance for a while, think about the visual world, think about cats, and say, well, you know, cats are certain colors, right? They're never purple, they're never red. Uh, maybe a histogram of the colors in this image is, is the kind of thing I want to keep around. And so, you know, you write some C++ code, and now you've got this different representation of the image, which is a histogram of the colors in it, right? And you play around with that for a while, and it gets fooled by this image because, you know, the red trousers in this image make it think it can't be a cat. It must be a sports car or something. And you think, okay, well, that was too naive. Okay, we can't just detect cats with colors. Maybe I'll make a fur detector and an eye detector and things like that. And this goes on for a while. Um, and what I'm getting at here is that that component of your machine learning system actually kind of has the same flavor as all these other uh, machine learning problems, which is that we don't actually know how to write it. There's actually not a principled way to figure out which features to extract, you know, how to weight them, and so on. Um, which ones are worth keeping around, which ones aren't worth keeping around. And so, you know, deep learning, which is this kind of sort of mystical sounding term, just refers to, to pushing the machine learning problem further back in the pipeline and saying, let's learn which features to extract, right? 
Um, and of course, you know, I'm, I'm drawing this as a caricature. All sort of real systems are some combination of you know more than one learned layer and more than one engineered layer. Um, but that's all people are really talking about, right? It's not that mystical, right? So, uh, what's deep about deep learning isn't some claim about profundity or you know that there's a, some sort of deep understanding taking place necessarily. Um, one of the, the things that we're doing here is we're learning hierarchical representations of the inputs, right? So we take these raw inputs, and usually there's more than one step of this sort of learned transformations that happen, right? So this picture is taken from uh, Alex Kruszewski's uh, paper in 2012 that sort of blew the doors off of the ImageNet competition that year, um, and it describes, you know, his model. The, um, the inputs are flowing from left to right in here, and it's not super important exactly what all the transforms are, but the point are, is that almost all these transforms have learned parameters in them, right? So you didn't start, you started somewhere random in white space and learned, you know, on the order of tens of millions of parameters for this model. Um, and the features sort of to the left that are near the raw pixels are lower level features, and the ones that are farther to the right are higher level features. And what's cool about this is actually these intermediate things are useful in and of themselves. Right, so not only did you solve this sort of image categorization benchmark problem that ImageNet's uh, you know, all about, you also learned a sort of general representation of images that you could you know, do things like you know, do nearest neighbor on, for instance, and say, uh, you know, is there some, are these images semantically similar, and ask lots of other questions like that. Uh, so cool, actually, if I could ask you guys to play these videos real quick. Thank you. Um, so these are, uh, these are the, um, the Sports 1M data set, which is a data set of about a million videos. Um, some colleagues of mine in, in Facebook AI research have uh, state of the art on this thing currently. Um, there are 487 sports, um, which doesn't sound like the hugest number in the world, but that's big enough to include things like uh, yoga and Greco-Roman wrestling and 10-pin bowling, and you don't get any credit for calling it breaststroke if it was actually the butterfly and so on. Um, so it's actually quite impressive that 85.2% of the time the right answer is in the top five of this. Um, and it feels like sort of a real stride in, in actually understanding what videos are of, right? And imagine if you were trying to do sort of the full, you know, custom engineered version of this, right? You'd have people sitting there saying, okay, badminton, I need a racket detector, and so on. Uh, and it would take you a while. Um, yeah, and, you know, here are people ice skating and figure skating and so on. Um, okay, cool. So that's that's the fun part, so why do, uh, you know, I'm not a machine learning person, right, the sort of math and creative part of this, I'm not able to make much of a contribution to. So what are there for systems people like me and you to do? Um, well, so I made a list of the top seven problems that, that systems people can help out the deep learning community with, uh, and here they are. Um, they're all about long training times. Um, and I stopped at seven partly because this slide, that's all that would fit with this font, that's also for the seven weeks that it took us to train that video model I just showed you. So that thing uh, you know, churned away, burning lots of watts uh, for seven weeks, and uh, it was still getting better. We actually don't know how much better it would get if we you know, wanted to run it, but eventually we had to write a paper about it. Um, so seven weeks is how long we were willing to train it for. Um, and you know, before jumping in here, I should say that sort of there's already been at least one kind of 10x jump here, and that's just the prevalence of GPGPUs in this area. Um, for a number of reasons, it turns out GPGPUs are a godsend for this particular application. Um, and by themselves, it's model dependent, it depends what you're trying to do, but you know, five to 10x speed ups over trying to operate on CPU are not unheard of at all. Um, and uh, you know, this is sort of a controversial thing, but in, in some ways I view the current revolution in deep learning, at least uh, for the, these sort of big vision models, to have more to do with GPGPUs than any sort of breakthroughs on the machine learning theory side of things. Like these you know, models have been proposed and played around with for a really long time, but if it would have taken you 35 weeks or you know, more than a year to train that model I just showed you, you, know, you can't do that. Nobody can operate that way, right? Um, the thing that you probably know about GP, GPUs is that you know, they have a lot of flops, right? You get a truckload of flops for you know, relatively cheap when you buy one of these things. Um, and it's true that we can use flops. But it's actually pretty rare that we're able to use one of these cards anywhere near its sort of peak flop rate. Most of the time we're actually uh, memory bandwidth limited. And sort of a less obvious thing if you don't you know, play around with these things all day long is that they're also sort of the world champion of memory bandwidth. Uh, so one of these uh, GPGPUs that is used for sort of servers um, has on the order of 10x better memory bandwidth than a nice server motherboard. Uh, and we'll sort of see why this application is so hungry for memory bandwidth uh, in a second. But that makes it very, very hard for CPUs to compute uh, in the current sort of place we're at in the design space for, uh, for server. There we are. 
Okay, great. So uh, to, to explain sort of what's hard next, we have to go into a little bit about how you actually train these things. Uh, the vast majority of these models that are being commercially used are being trained with some variant of stochastic gradient descent. And my cartoon of stochastic gradient descent goes something like this, right? You know, until you get bored of watching your model train, you take some tiny slice of your training data and you shove it through your model. Uh, that produces some error, and that error is, you know, some scalar that's always greater than zero, uh, unless you happen to get it perfectly right, I guess, and then you didn't learn anything from looking at this data. Um, and you literally run the chain rule of calculus to figure out uh, exactly which direction to move every parameter in your model to make that error go down. And you take a little step in that direction, and you lather and you rinse and you repeat. And you do that until the paper deadline comes, and then you hit control C, and you measure your thing, and you know, start making figure one and so on. Um, so just something that, that you know, surprises a fair amount of systems people that I've talked to about this who've never thought about this before. There's no like, guessing and checking involved. right? You never go back and see, oh, did I actually make it better? You made it better. Calculus works. Don't worry. You know? um, and if you do this long enough, you'll, your model eventually finds some local minimum in error space. Um, now, so what's the problem here? Well, I mean, if you look at sort of what we're doing here, the model parameters are getting updated every time, and every time you take another trip through this loop, you've got to look at these things again, right? You're looking at on the order of, you know, tens or maybe hundreds of, of examples in each one of these trips out of a data set that's at least in the millions. Um, so a full trip through the data set's going to be, you know, maybe 100,000, maybe 10,000 iterations of this thing. Each time you're doing it, you're, you know, reading a fair amount of data, you're overriding a fair amount of data. But the, the point is there's this big sort of serial step here, which is every time I take a step in the model, I need to actually compute some more until, uh, you know, there's no sort of easy parallelization opportunity there. Um, and so, you know, I claim that um, every, you know, however you end up parallelizing this, and we'll take a look at a few different strategies, you're gonna end up having to sort of send something big across some kind of communication fabric, whether it's PCIe or InfiniBand or Ethernet or whatever. Uh, you know, LTE, um, and therefore this is just not a trivial algorithm to parallelize, right? This is just never going to be that easy to do. Um, and, you know, I, I'm saying here, by the way, that training set, data sets are, you know, italicized big, um, and I'm being sort of intentionally vague about that, but I mean, for the most part, it's not, you know, XLDB big, right? The, the benchmarks that, that people compete on these days are usually, you know, in the terabytes. Uh, for instance, that Sports 1 million data set um, was on the order of 50 terabytes, uh, it's, you know, 1.3 million videos. We actually trained on only 10 terabytes of it. We threw away a whole bunch of the, of the actual training data just because a lot of them were really long videos that, you know, don't provide as much value per byte as the short videos. Uh, so we favored the short videos and, you know, get away with it. Um, if distributed training worked better, we'd be able to train on a ton more data and we'd be able to have, you know, much deeper and much wider models. And we think that nobody's been able to do it yet have much better quality at these things. Um, so, you know, the, the strategies for trying to parallelize these things uh, break down into sort of data parallel and model parallel and then hybrids and variants. Um, real quick, data parallel, and, and just to kind of ground the figure here, uh, you know, in the ML world, data floats. So the inputs kind of come in the bottom of the image and they come out the top. Uh, it confuses ML audiences if you don't draw the figure this way. It confuses systems audiences if you do draw the figure this way, but that's what's going on. Um, and, you know, in data parallel world, you, you take the data set, you split it into n shards, you train a bunch of different replicas on the different parts of the data set. One problem that you have with doing this is that um, you've got n different models now, right? They all sort of went different places because they all computed different gradients. So you do need to actually sync these things back up every once in a while. So there's going to be communication taking place across the sort of border of this dashed line here. And that communication is going to be, uh, you know, in this case, proportional to the size of the model. Um, but it's actually, in general, it gets worse if uh, you're actually doing n greater than two. Right? If you're doing n greater than two, you need to make a reduced tree on this thing or something. Um, you need to you know, choose some sort of communication pattern. Uh, model parallel is exploiting sort of inherent locality in the, the computation that your model does. So this is a little bit model specific. You need to know a little bit about uh, what people are actually trying to compute. And basically, you need to be able to recover this graph that I'm drawing here from whatever the runtime representation of, of the model is. Um, but the good news with this is that uh, the communication that happens here is proportional to inputs and outputs from those layers instead of proportional to the size of the model. Um, one of the other nice things about model parallel is this lets you have um, models that are too big to fit in one worker's memory. 
which can be important. Um, but you know, since all the inputs are still coming from the same place, you need to be able to fit all the data locally, right? So these things do compose. A lot of people do run uh, you know, data parallel, lots of little replicas of model parallel workers. Um, and all of this stuff happens, you know, of course everybody's here advertising something or other, right? And I'm, I'm here advertising Torch, uh, which is the open source scientific compute platform that we use in, in uh, Facebook AI research and that's been adopted at some of, uh, in a bunch of other industrial and academic uh, areas. Torch is, um, is basically a scientific compute binding for LuaJet. So uh, Lua is used as sort of a productivity glue language. Um, all the heavy lifting and you know, allocating memory on your GPU and you know, trying to overlap copies with compute and so on and so forth is happening in C and C++. Um, it's open source. You know, please give it a shot. If, let us know if you run into any problems. Just to give you sort of some sense of uh, you know, the kinds of things that Torch makes possible. Um, this creates a simple neural network um, sequential is a container that holds, you know, a, a pipeline of components. Linear is a, a matrix multiply. Threshold uh, applies a, a nonlinearity that chops off anything that's smaller than zero. Um, and the little bits in red are all you need to do to make one of these things data parallel. Um, so it used to be kind of, you know, a year or so ago before we made this data parallel module, if you wanted to do this, you kind of would write a bunch of crazy CUDA code and debug it, and it would be a bunch of effort. Um, so this is sort of relatively uh, accessible way of, of doing sort of single system image parallelism in Torch 7. This is all open source stuff. Uh, you, know, you can get it from, uh, from our GitHub page. So um, thus ends the sort of chest beating part of the presentation and now the groveling begins. So uh, distributed deep learning I claim is actually a pretty unsatisfactorily solved problem. There are lots of papers written about it. Um, you know, if you talk to the people who write those papers, does it feel to them like we've really nailed this yet? I don't think it does. Um, I certainly don't feel that way. Uh, if you look at the actual kind of counts of machines that are actually training practically useful models and getting them to go faster than smaller numbers of machines, we're getting into sort of the tens, right? Not the hundreds, not the thousands, not the tens of thousands, but you know, tens and teens and twenties. Um, and the, the, you know, the, the big sort of counterexample to this that you'll see is uh, you know, a bunch of our, our colleagues at Google uh, built this system back in 2012, which was very early in sort of this current you know, cycle uh, around neural networks, uh, describing a parameter server architecture. And this basically you know, takes your big pile of machines and bisects them into two classes. You have parameter servers, which are gonna be where uh, tensors, where you know, these sort of shapes of uh, these you know, NumPy ND arrays, if you prefer, are going to reside. Uh, and workers, which are gonna do compute. And you know, a nice thing about this is that you get to scale compute differently from you know, how you scale your, your data. Um, there's some unfortunate things around communication patterns for some, for some use cases, right? You can kind of tell there's this kind of fully connected pattern of communication in a lot of cases. Um, but you know, it's something and it's out there and it's certainly where you'd wanna start with this. Um, and it's one of those sort of loose threads that, uh, that feels like it's, a, it's one of the right directions. But, um, if there's actually a lot of communication, if your model actually sort of uses all of these parameters in a given input, for instance, um, this actually doesn't get you very far. This doesn't do very many of the hard parts for you. There's um, another interesting thread here that's actually just from sort of a different community entirely, and that's uh, the world of sensor networks. So if you go around looking at sort of uh, papers from the early aughts in sensor networks, they were solving a problem that sounds an awful lot like the problem that uh, distributed deep learning systems are trying to do, right? Which is that they're trying to find, achieve consensus on a point in you know, a high dimensional space um, without too much communication. And there's a nice rich body of sort of theory and algorithms over there in sensor network land that basically tells you how little you need to communicate for a point moving you know, uh, in space among n different workers to achieve consensus about it, right? Um, there, there are, I've heard a few people mention this before. I'm not sure that anybody's done anything practical with it yet. Um, so the, the sort of hope that this holds out is that you can do things other than just sort of synchronously screaming about where you just moved to every time you move somewhere, right? The problem right now with trying to do distributed stuff uh, with these systems is every time you, you know, take a little step in wait space, you have to spend you know, a second or so sending the four gigabytes of you know, where you are in wait space now to everybody who wants to know about it. Um, and you know, the sensor network world you know, has theorems about how little you can do this, how rarely you can do it, and so on, and still expect it to converge. 
Um, and here comes a sort of speculative and coy part of this, right? So what if we sort of try the, the parameter server uh, setup, but instead of partitioning things into workers and, and parameter servers, we try to make no distinction. We try to say that this is just gonna be a, a global namespace for, for these tensors and we have a distributed shared memory of them. Um, speaking of sort of ideas that you know, time has not been super kind to, right? Um, and we're just gonna draw a sort of simple version of this here where you know, you've, got, you've got these three members of our distributed shared memory. They've got one big parameter vector that's spread across them um, and they have a sort of global understanding of what lives where. Um, and we, we start a model parallel training job where um, each one of these shards needs to use some combination of its local and remote uh, shards. And so it pulls over some copy of these things, let's call them P prime. And you know, because we know that what we're gonna do with this application is, is this machine learning application, we know that we can tolerate a certain amount of staleness. Right? So we know that sort of P3 does not in general necessarily equal P prime sub three, for instance. Uh, but we know that they're pretty close, and pretty close is gonna be defined in some application specific way. So uh, we finish this portion of our training job. We update our local parameters in place, um, and we update the remote parameters in place. And now something interesting just happened, right? So if you look at sort of P1, for instance, um, P1 just got updated both on sort of shard one and shard two. Um, so, you know, isn't this just sort of a classic, aren't things a total mess? Well, you know, they aren't if, if the training protocol we applied was some variant of SGD, was some variant stochastic gradient descent, because these updates weren't overwrites, they were adjustments. And if we remember the deltas, we, they commute. We can add them together and, uh, and recover something that would have been what would have happened if this computer had happened on one machine. Um, so if we keep those deltas around and send them back, you know, we can discard our sort of buffered copies and uh, get on with things. So you may sort of gather from the way I'm talking about this that this isn't uh, entirely, you know, nonsense, but it's also not something that um, we're willing to say is successful yet. Uh, but it's a direction we're excited about. Uh, so works in progress here, uh, and please stay tuned. Um, oh, there we go. Okay, cool. So I'm very early here, apparently, so. Uh, higher order bits here is this is an important class of applications that's not going anywhere. Um, if you sort of haven't seen this technology demoed recently, again, you know, computers are sort of doing things that uh, we're not used to thinking of computers doing, and this is why, to a first order approximation. So this class of applications is, you know, really important. Um, it is also a class of applications that we don't know how to just scale out in the way that we'd like to just scale out. And that feels a little counterintuitive from a systems person perspective, right? Coming to this thing, it feels like, uh, first of all, right, there's this big biological analogy supposedly with brains, which are obviously sort of inherently distributed and, you know, have communication limitations. But, you know, sure, let's ignore the biological, you know, analogy because machine learning people sort of uh, start rolling their eyes when you, when you do it too much. Um, like, even that aside, you're training on these gigantic data sets, right? We know a lot about how to sort of stream data, right? We're used to sort of, you know, kind of scoffing at petabytes of data and so on. And yet here we are, you know, having trouble making a few thousand passes over a couple terabytes of data. Um, and in general, it feels like there's sort of a big wide open area here to make this stuff go faster. Um, you know, maybe SGD really can be improved upon in some fundamental way, right? Maybe there is some training algorithm that doesn't have, uh, you know, an inherent serial bottleneck sitting right there in the middle of it. Uh, and there are a few candidates for what that might be. People have been able to de demonstrate that you actually can train networks this way. People have not been able to demonstrate that you, know, you can throw a thousand machines at it and actually get a win from it yet. But that could be a simple matter of engineering. Um, the actual hardware side of this is still wide open. The, the, you know, the actual investments involved are large enough that uh, fabbing hardware is not out of the question if you knew the wins were big enough. Um, and, and obviously there's still a ton of software uh, waiting to be written, right? So.